Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we've got yet another little NAS to check out from Synology. This one just came out today, I think. Uh, this is the DS620 Slim, and it's got six drive bays on it that will incorporate two and a half inch SATA drives. So you can use SSDs like the ones we've gotten here right now, or you can use laptop hard drives with it. And it's a fully functional six bay NAS with an Intel processor inside, so it actually does a pretty decent job at media serving as well. Uh, there are a couple of gotchas with this one, including uh, the price to get it all up and running. We're gonna cover all of that in just a second, but I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from Synology. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. I should also mention that Synology is an occasional sponsor here on the channel, but they are not sponsoring this video. So let's get into it now and see what this little NAS is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. The cost on this one is $449, and that is without any drives. You have to bring your own drives to the mix here, so the cost will go up substantially, especially if you choose solid state drives. You do need to be careful about the kind of drives you pick for your NAS device because solid state drives wear out the more you write to them. Uh, they did throw in a couple into my loaner unit here from Seagate. These are the new Iron Wolf SSDs that are rated for more write cycles than standard consumer drives are, but the cost on these tends to be about twice as much as what you would get out of a cheap consumer drive. So my advice to you is that if you are planning to do a lot of heavy writes to this drive on a constant basis, solid state drives are probably not going to be for you unless you get something that's rated for that level of write activity. Uh, these drives are more expensive because they over provision them, uh, basically putting on more flash cells so that as they wear out, they swap in the, the ones that weren't used. Uh, but spinning drives do not have that issue. So just be aware of that. This is probably not something that you would buy for heavy writing, uh, but might be more in tune with a photographer or a video creator who is writing data once to it and essentially leaving it there. Now inside the box is an Intel processor, a J3355. It's an Apollo Lake chip, very similar to what we've seen on a lot of mini PCs that we have looked at. And it's the same processor that's in their 218 Plus, which is one of the ones that I often recommend to folks who are on a budget but want some of the functionality. Uh, this one costs $300, again, the same processor, that 3355, uh, but it only has two drives and it uses much larger desktop drives like these. Uh, but this is definitely an alternative to consider, especially if you want to not spend as much uh, getting everything up and running. The uh, hardware inside is the same. Uh, like the 218 Plus, the uh, 620 Slim here has only two gigs of RAM installed, but you can upgrade it to six. So you can buy a four gig DDR3 module, pop it in there, and you'll have more RAM available for some of the more advanced features that this supports. I did a video on some of the things that you can do with one of these higher end devices from Synology, which I will link to down below in my master playlist. We're gonna to touch on some of those things in this review, but that video will give you much more detail. Now, one thing I really like about this NAS is that we have six drive bays here, which gives you a ton of flexibility for configuring your NAS. Now, what I did with this one is I set it up as the Synology Hybrid RAID 2 or SHR2. And that will allow for any two of these drives to fail without my data getting lost. And I think that is a great option when you have this many drive bays. You can still gain a lot of capacity from all the drives installed and have a little bit of data security with that uh, because you will have the ability to lose a drive or two uh, without any problems. And when that does happen, uh, you can pull out the bad drive and put in a new one and it will rebuild the array for you automatically without interrupting your work. And again, I just think it's good to just have that ability to have two drives fail on you versus one. Uh, you could, of course, go for a one drive failure option and have more storage available to you. Another thing you could do is install a bunch of less expensive spinning drives in some of these bays and then put in a solid state drive in only one of the bays and have it act as an SSD cache. So that way you'd have some of the random access advantages of a solid state drive yet all the storage capacity of a slower spinning drive. So you've got a lot of storage flexibility in here, and it's also a lot less expensive, believe it or not, than some of the other six bay devices that Synology makes. 
Uh, just know, though, that your storage cost, of course, will be more. Uh, this only has these six bays. There is not a separate SSD slot like some of those other higher cost Synology devices have. Now, as great as the front of the device is, there are some problems here on the back. The big one for me is what they chose for networking options. You do have two gigabit ethernet jacks back here, but I think a device that's largely designed for solid state drives should have something faster, uh, namely 10 gigabit support. This doesn't have it, nor is there a way to upgrade to it. And that to me is the biggest miss on this because you can pick up, especially with SSDs, more performance than you can squeeze out of these two gigabit ethernet jacks back here. Having two is helpful though because you could, for example, run a security server on one of these uh, ports and then have the other one go out to the rest of your network. You certainly have enough uh, drive capacity here insofar as performance is concerned to support both activities without any performance degradation. But I do think having gigabit or 10 gigabit ethernet would have been a better choice here. It is becoming much more in reach of consumers. Uh, right here, you've got a Kensington lock slot for locking this little guy down on a desk or in a server room somewhere. And I want to flip it around back to the front real quick because they also give you some keys in the box, which will allow you to lock down the drives themselves. So what we saw on their other little NAS is that you could you know, not, get, not take the NAS with you, but very easily pull the drives out. On this one, once you lock it with the key, uh, you cannot open it up like we can here on the other ones which are unlocked. So you can lock it down on the desk and lock the port. That might be something that will be useful for folks looking to uh, more physically secure their devices here. Uh, power goes in here. We'll take a look at power consumption in a little bit. And then you've got two USB 3.0 ports here on the back that are useful for data transfer. You can plug in external hard drives for backup, for example. I believe you can also use some wireless devices with it in these. Uh, you can also use your Synology device as a print server. Uh, one of the things that I have configured in my server room is my UPS over that USB port. Uh, so when my power goes out, it signals the NAS through the USB. And when it's about to die, it'll shut the NAS down properly so I don't lose data. There's a lot of different things you can do with these ports, and there's a lot of support there for it. Uh, there is a fan on here. Uh, it is not that noisy, but you'll hear it. So if you wanted a perfectly silent office, uh, this is not a silent NAS. But if you did go with the solid state drives, the uh, rest of the unit will not be making any noise. And I have found uh, with these NAS devices, when you've got you know, six or four uh, spinning hard drives right next to each other, they do make a ton of noise, sometimes more than the fans themselves. Uh, this one's a lot quieter than a traditional NAS. There's no air filter in here, but you can pop the fan off to service it if you need to do that. And it does seem to be keeping itself very cool, even though it's got uh, six drives in here right next to each other. So that is the overall hardware. Let's boot it up and see what you can do with it. All right, so here we are on the home page of the 620 Slim's control panel. And one of the things you gain from the Intel chip in here is access to some of the premium features that we see on some of their Plus devices. And again, check out my Plus video to learn more about these things. Uh, so the first thing I popped open was Docker. And you'll notice here that it's actually seeing the full 8 gigs of RAM I put inside of it. The spec sheet listed 6 max, but it looks like 8 is available here. I've got two sticks of 4 uh, inside of the box right now, so that was a neat thing to see. Uh, and I've got a little VNC server running inside of one of my containers that I loaded up into Docker. And what's cool about Docker is that uh, this application is running isolated from the rest of the system. And what I can do is actually remote in and gain access to some of the features that this container provides. This one is very simple. It's just a VNC server with a basic desktop and a web browser. Uh, so I can load up Firefox, uh, which is now running inside of the NAS and browse the web here a little bit if I want to do that. I've played with a few others that allow you to install LibreOffice and a few other things as well. There's a ton of different things that you can run. A lot of folks like to install servers inside of containers because they are completely isolated from the rest of the system. So if perhaps somebody were to hack into your WordPress server running inside a container, for example, they won't have access to the rest of the NAS in doing so. And that's a risk sometimes you might have if you uh, use the WordPress server here in the package center. Uh, now you'll look on our usage here. Uh, we're using about 8% of the CPU. And right now the uh, Docker container here is only using 414 megabytes of RAM. So this is a lot less RAM usage than I would have 
if I booted up a virtual machine, for example. But if you want to do that, you can because we installed the virtual machine manager on here a little bit earlier. And I actually have a full Windows installation here that I can boot up. Uh, right now it is powered off, but I'm going to switch it on. Uh, this, of course, demands many more system resources, especially memory. So I allocated only one gigabyte for this, but when I do boot up Windows here, it's going to use that full gig, which will not be available to the rest of my system, although a lot of the things that will be running inside of this Windows container are isolated from the rest of the NAS box. And if I click on Connect here, it'll pop up a separate window, and I'm able to see what's going on inside of that virtual machine as it boots up. So right now we're loading Windows 10 uh, on this box, and in a second or two, it will uh, log me in, and I can go ahead and use Windows like I would anything else. So let's let this boot up here, and when it is done, uh, we'll pop back in and see what we can do with it. All right, so we now have Windows 10 booted up on our NAS here, and we're operating it through a web browser. Uh, this is not going to be the fastest Windows 10 experience in the world for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we've got a mini PC processor running uh, all of this in addition to keeping the NAS up and running. Second is that we've only allocated a gig of RAM to this activity. And third, we're running it through a web browser. Uh, but you will see slightly faster, snappier performance if you connect over Windows Remote Desktop, the RDP protocol. And that's something we're going to do in a second. But by and large, this is not something that I would expect to replace a desktop Windows computer with, but it is something that might be useful if you are running something in Windows that you need running 24-7. Uh, you can install it in here and uh, be able to largely do that, provided you have enough RAM available to you. All right, so let's shift gears now and see how this performs over the network. One of the great things about network attached storage is that it shows up like a computer on your network that you can share files with. And as you can see here, it found our uh, DS620 on the network. I'm just going to connect up to it real quick and point my uh, Blackmagic speed test application at a directory on the 620 Slim. We're going to start that test. And as you can see here, we are maxing out that gigabit connection for the most part, uh, writing at around 100 megabytes per second, give or take. And as you see on the read speeds, we're uh, hitting about 108, 110 or so. Uh, on that side of the test. So overall, this is performing as I would expect it to, as it should perform, uh, given what it has inside. And it is doing just as well as some of the more expensive NAS boxes out there, but it can do better. And here's something interesting. Uh, we're gonna load up the Windows virtual machine that is still running right now uh, on this box. And let me just zoom out here and pull up that session real quick. And what I've got here is the same test, but we're gonna run it locally on the Windows server to see exactly how much potential speed there is if we had a faster connection. And as you can see, uh, even with my SHR2 RAID array here, uh, we're getting three times the sequential write performance and significantly faster read performance out of this same device because it is not bottlenecked by the Ethernet connection. Uh, so I think there's a lot more potential that's kind of locked away inside of this box because they don't have that 10 gigabit option. Now we're going to jump back to my Mac here over the network to see if there's any impact in using an encrypted folder versus an unencrypted one. So I set up an encrypted file share on the NAS a little bit earlier. We're going to start that test up now and see if we have any performance degradation. We are seeing about a 10 megabyte per second or so hit in write speeds over the network to an encrypted folder, uh, but no real impact here on reads. So I think you won't see much of a performance degradation if you do decide to encrypt some or all of the folders on the drive, but there will be some here. And this also puts a little bit more load on the Intel processor, which might impact the virtual machine performance or perhaps impact performance of other people hitting the device here at the same time. It's only a dual core processor, so it will get bogged down sometimes, especially if you've got a lot of stuff running in the background and you're doing these encrypted folders and a bunch of other stuff too. There's just a limit uh, to how much the hardware inside of this thing can do, but overall, it seems to perform quite well, I think, for a home or a small office environment. All right, let's see how well it does now as a media server. We've got Plex here running on the NAS, and what I'm doing right now is transcoding two Blu-ray MKVs from 1080p to 720p. 
at four megabits per second, a pretty significant uh, transcode here. And one is going to my iPad, the other is going to the iPhone. And all seems to be working pretty well here. If we dive into the control panel, you can see that uh, the video process here is being done in hardware. That's because the processor supports that hardware transcoding. And you can see what kind of load we have on the CPU as these two devices are getting served media. So it looks like we've got room maybe for another stream or two. And of course, this will be impacted by what else you are running on the NAS at the time. So just be aware of some of the other things running. It will take an impact on uh, your video performance. But overall, it seems to be working just fine. And it works just as well as that 218 Plus I mentioned a little bit earlier. I have found that over time, the quad-core chips tend to do better at this transcode versus what we're seeing uh, typically with a dual-core. But if you're not doing too much else with your NAS, I think you'll be in pretty good shape. Now at idle, we were looking at about 14 to 15 watts of power consumption. Uh, that is with the drives activated, but the system under no load. When we put the system under load, we saw the power jump up to about 20 watts or so. I'd imagine you would see a reduction in power consumption when it puts the drives to sleep, but if you are using this as a server, it's likely that something will be hitting the drives all the time, and that likely will keep things activated and at that 14 watt level there. So overall, I'm fairly pleased with what they've put together here. I like the fact that they've got an Intel processor in the box. It would have been better to have a quad core, but I'll take the dual core. It seems to work okay. I like also that it's a six bay NAS at a fairly competitive price for a six bay NAS. Uh, those cost savings though are immediately offset by the higher cost of storage, especially if you go the SSD route, but it is quiet, it is compact. It's something that I think if you're not writing to all that often, you could probably put in some mid-range consumer SSDs and probably be okay, uh, provided you uh, probably run in that two drive failure configuration. And if you want the safety, going up to those uh, Seagate Ironwolf drives will give you a little bit more peace of mind. But overall, I think from the hardware configuration here, this is a pretty nice unit. I was very disappointed though with the choice of ethernet on this. I would almost be willing to pay an extra 100 bucks to have the 10 gigabit as an option because we saw inside of that virtual machine what the potential is inside of this box that you'll never be able to get to because the bottleneck is the ethernet connection in the back. So if they had a 10 gig connector on there, I think this would have been a real slam dunk. Uh, it's not as future proof as I'd like it to be without that 10 gig connector, but it is a pretty solid device nonetheless. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. We'll have this for a couple more weeks, so if there's anything else you want me to try out with it, do let me know down in the comment stream and we'll try to do a follow up in the days or weeks to come. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters, including gold level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, emudev.org. Tom Albrecht, Brian Parker, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.